Welcome to these thoughts on Good Friday. I'm going to be reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, and beginning at verse 26. Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, beginning at verse 26. As they led Jesus away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country and put the cross on him, and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you were the king of the Jews... Save yourself. There was a notice written above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve that this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, noon, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him out from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph, and saw the tomb, and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home, and prepared spices and perfume, but they rested on the Sabbath obedience to the commandment. We thank you, God, for your word. One of the most remarkable sets of stories in recent weeks across the world has been those whose bravery allows them to continue working on the front line during this virus, putting themselves in danger of infection because of the need to help others. Carers, 
shop workers and delivery people, teachers working with the children of key workers, refuse collectors and cleaners, the police, but perhaps most of all the health workers, the ambulance drivers, the doctors and nurses coming into regular contact with the virus and not knowing whether it might prove fatal to them. There have been cases where retired doctors have returned to work to help out and save others' lives and been taken by the virus themselves. Amidst the sorrow and tragedy, these cases of undeserved death are also remarkable stories of self-sacrifice. As Jesus hung on the cross, he too was taking a punishment he didn't deserve. Dying a death for which he had committed no crime. Luke, in his account, chooses not to focus on the physical suffering of the cross, but instead looks at the purpose of it all and the impact on those around Jesus at the time. Jesus on the cross is mocked by many people, by the crowd, the chief priests, the soldiers, and one of the criminals, who all basically say the same thing. He saved others, but he cannot save himself. Yet we know that if Jesus had saved himself, he couldn't have saved others. This suffering and death was God's purpose for mankind and the world. This has been foretold in the Old Testament in the most detailed account of the crucifixion found in the Bible, Isaiah chapters 52 to 53. Isaiah 53 verse 10 says, It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Speaking of the suffering servant, Isaiah makes it clear firstly that Jesus freely chooses to suffer and die, but secondly that he is acting in accordance with his Father's will. That battle had already been won in the Garden of Gethsemane the previous night. And Jesus pleaded to be relieved of this cup of suffering, but yet yielded to his father with the words, Not what I will, but what you will. We look at those dying of coronavirus and feel it's not fair. It isn't. But even more so, it wasn't fair that Jesus died. The sinless dies for the sinners. Barabbas, a murderer, is saved in his place. Paul explains it in his letter to the Romans. Just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 verses 6 to 8. The truth is all of us are going to die at some point but Jesus has taken the punishment for our sin already. All we have to do is to trust him. That puts a very different perspective on how we approach a crisis such as this virus. If death holds no fear beyond the hurt and sorrow for those it leaves behind we can continue to live in hope and peace and purpose. And we should long that others will know this peace and hope and faith for themselves too. In the narrative of the crucifixion, we find faith in unexpected people. Apart from John, the disciples have disappeared and hidden. But the women proved stronger and more loyal staying to the end and following the funeral procession to the tomb. It is important that the first witnesses of the resurrection saw that Jesus actually died and was actually buried. Their devotion and worship as they keep watch and their plan to anoint the body after the Sabbath are soon to be richly rewarded. Simon of Cyrene was probably on pilgrimage as a Jew from Libya traveling for the Passover. We are told that he had just arrived from the countryside and was forced by the Romans to join the story unexpectedly, to carry the cross 
when Jesus was too exhausted to carry on. We can't be certain, but it seems likely that Luke referred to him as a witness when later putting the Gospel together. He is mentioned in three of the Gospels, and his children, who are named in Mark's Gospel, may have become missionaries. So it is quite probable that Simon came to faith sometime between the crucifixion and the day of Pentecost, when people from Cyrene were among those who heard the disciples explaining the resurrection of Jesus to the assembled crowds. Then there's the centurion, who makes a declaration of who Jesus is as he dies, and the curtain of the temple is torn in two from top to bottom, so therefore an act of God, not of man. This man, responsible for overseeing the crucifixion, likely to be a weekly task for him, sees in this event the innocence of Jesus. The supernatural darkness and the earthquake would have no doubt left a strong impression too, but surely it is Jesus' words and behaviour that are the most compelling in bringing this man to a statement of belief. Then Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea are from the ruling council, and they both make a public statement by burying Jesus at their own expense. They had much to lose in terms of position and reputation, having already not consented to sentence Jesus to death. Yet the man who had come to Jesus in secret by night in John chapter 3 is now openly part of the burial of the one who had become his saviour. And finally, the repentant thief is a most unlikely convert. Unlike his fellow crucified criminal, he recognises his own sin, and in contrast, sees Jesus' sinlessness. But this man goes further than the centurion, who has also realised this. The criminal sees that Jesus has the power to save him, and therefore he asks for mercy. Such simple faith is all that is required to be a follower, to recognise our sin and renounce it, to recognise who Jesus is and that he has all authority and power to help us because he is God. But more than that, he is willing to help us. And all we must ask to do, all we must do, is ask for that help. Jesus is very clear in his response to this thing, that his simple faith has saved him and given him the promise of salvation. The repentant thief is given full assurance by Jesus. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. We are surrounded by fear and death at the moment. Actually, this is always true, but it is just more obvious currently. But anyone who has trusted in Jesus for their salvation need have no fear of death. Jesus has conquered our sin on the cross, if we have given it over to him by confessing and being sorry, repenting of our wrongs. And Jesus has conquered death by rising from the dead, the first fruits of all who believe, so that anyone who is in Christ, who has died to their old life, will also be raised with him. This gives us great confidence in a time of trial. And it also gives us great news to share with others who are fearful at this time. The promise of salvation is real. It can be trusted. And it was won on the cross by our Saviour Jesus. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross, taking the punishment for our sin. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were willing to walk that road of pain and suffering and shame that you did not deserve. Thank you that you gave your life that you might save others. Help us to trust in your grace in that freely offered salvation that you bought at such a price. And help us, Lord, 
to share this good news with our loved ones, with those with whom we work, with our friends, with the strangers. I pray that this Easter time you would help us to bring light and hope and faith in a world that is despairing and fearful. Send us out by the power of your Spirit to live and work 